If you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians this morning, chapter 4. And also, if you would, the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 13. So Philippians chapter 4, and then if you would, just put your thumb on Numbers 13. As I said in the beginning a little while ago, I got to thinking about encouragement this week while I was mowing the yard. And I got to thinking about Philippians 4, where Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Praiseworthy, think about such things. And I was thinking about encouragement and thinking about the things of God, about the Word of God and the promises that God has given us through His Word. And I actually entitled this sermon, Think About Such Things. Because as believers in Christ, we should think about what is true. We should think about what is noble. We should think about what is right. We should think about what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. But here's the catch. It's what God has defined as all these things, all these truths, not what society has. And we are to set our minds on things above, as Paul says in the book of Colossians, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that we are to renew our minds. In Christ. And how do we do that? By the reading of His Word. As it says in Psalm 119. Your Word is a what? Light into my path. And a lamp into my feet. If we want to think about the good things. We have to fill our minds full of God's Word. And over in Numbers we see the opposite of that. You see negativity. You see discouragement. And that brothers and sisters, can go and cause a lot of trouble within a church. I reached out to some pastor friends of mine. I asked them, I said, guys, you've been in the ministry for a while. What are some, what is some negativity? What, what's some discouragement that you've heard? I, I wrote down a few of my own, but I want you to tell me some things too. And I just got like five or six of them here. I'm not going to keep you here all day with them. But I just want to, I just want to tell you, so, so this, is, this is what we hear as pastors as we serve in churches. Number one, it's, this is probably the one I've heard the most over my time in ministry, is to have somebody say after church, well, I didn't get fed today. Now let me tell you what that means. The pastor didn't preach good. Or, I just wasn't satisfied with the service. I want you to think about this just for a moment. And it's every time that that's been told to me, the person was standing there empty handed. There was no Bible in their hand. That's like going to a buffet without a plate. You hear me? It's like going to a buffet without a plate. You're not eating. You don't have your Bible in your hand. You're not eating. So that, that's probably for me the, the number one is I didn't get fed today. And, and secondly, of course, this is funny, is I've always heard this. Well, I didn't like the music. Now, nobody say that today. Because Kyler just came and sang, okay? Take that home with you today, all right? But they will say that. Well, I didn't like the music. Do you hear a theme developing? 
I, I, I don't like this. I don't like that. Let me ask you a question. I've asked this now for years. Why are you here today? Are you here for you or are you here for the Lord? Because that makes a big difference when you come and sit in church. I didn't get fed. I don't like the music. Oh, the church, the church service is too long. A pastor friend of mine told me that. He said, yeah, my people say the church, the church service is too long. We sing too much. You preach too long, pastor. That's why I've always tried here to keep it between 25 and 30 minutes. I just do. I see your faces. I know when somebody's thinking about eating. I just do. I know. I know that when your backside gets a little numb, the brain gets a little numb. I know all these things. Because I can read your face and your body language. Church service is too long. You know, I've never heard anybody complain that it's too short. <laughs> never. Here's a good one. The negativity. It's opposite of what we're supposed to think in Philippians 4. We're to think about the good things. Here's something that's negative. Well, I told them my way was better. Oh, I've heard that over the years. I don't like the way they did vacation Bible school. My way would have been a lot better. Do you see how that can cause disaster in a congregation? We're going to see here in a minute in Numbers 14, 13 to 14, how this kind of negativity, after God has laid down His promise in Numbers 13, verse 1, and yet there was so much negativity that affected the whole people of Israel. Well, I told them my way was better, but they didn't listen. So let me cause trouble for the people who wouldn't listen. That's how this works, guys. I've been a victim of that. I know. Other pastors have too. Other deacons have. Other church members have. All because somebody's way didn't get done. This is one pastor told me. He says, well, people say, we well, just don't visit me enough. You don't visit me enough. <laughs> this one takes the cake. A friend of mine told me, he said, brother, he said, he said, there's a woman in the church that hated my car. Hated my car. Didn't think I'd have been driving a convertible. You know, it always strikes me funny. And I don't know where people get this, 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 this thought process from. I really don't. Well, well, God called you to be a pastor, so He called you to be poor. That's nowhere in the Bible, God. Nowhere in the Bible. It blows my mind. We're supposed to be poor. Everybody else can go out and buy an $80,000 truck. Now I'm supposed to ride around in a big wheel. I mean, seriously, where do you get this stuff from? I don't know, but, but he was like, he's like, Scott, she hated my car. And it goes beyond that. She hated the floral arrangements that I put in the, in the, in the sanctuary. Like, wow. Then she hated the banners that we would hang because they like to hang banners up in their churches that have Bible verses on them. And she hated those. And I thought, my gosh, do you wear a bulletproof vest when you preach? Because clearly she hates you. Do you see how that can affect a congregation? When somebody hates everything that's going on in the church? Here's a good question to ask those types of people. Are you really saved? 
Are you truly born again by the Spirit of God? You're bringing so much negativity into the house of God. You bring so much hate into the house of God. So much division into the house of God. Are you really saved? It's an appropriate question. Think on the good things, Paul says in Philippians 4. And we'll get back there. But if you have your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. I want you to listen. This is the conquest of Canaan. This is where, this is where Moses sends out the spies to, to see the land. But, but the most important truth about all this in Numbers 13 starting in verse 1. This is God talking to Moses. And listen to what God says. And guys, this, this applies here today to the Bible. And we have God's Word. And so this is God speaking to us. And this is His truth to us. And so when you, when you see this book, know that this is God's Word to you. And as a Christian, we're supposed to read it and devour it and take it in and believe it and be obedient to it and live it out. And the Lord said to Moses, Numbers 13 verse 1, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. This reminds me of Jesus going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And at the very beginning of that conversation, Jesus Tells his disciples, this is going to be for God's glory. He tells them up front that everything's going to be okay. And what does his disciples do? You can't go there, they're going to try to kill you. But at the very beginning, he tells them, no, guys, it's going to be okay. Go read it. John chapter 14. I'm sorry, no, John chapter 11. Not 14, 11. John chapter 11. And so here God says, look, I'm going to give you this land. So the promise up front is I'm going to give it to you. Remember that as we read the rest of this. So they go and they explore Canaan. And they come back. And they give the report on their, explore, on their exploration. They give the report to Moses and the people that are standing there. So in Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 26. It says they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. So they went and they collected fruit that was part of the assignment to bring back to show what was there. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey! Exclamation point. Here is the fruit. But, <laughs> don't you love that? It's flowing with milk and honey. Just like God said. Look at all this gorgeous fruit we get to eat. Here is everything. Here is everything. But the people who live there are powerful. The people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites. They live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. So God, it was everything You said it was going to be, but... Look at all this stuff. They started to do what? Become negative. They weren't thinking about the promises of God. They were thinking on the things that they saw in front of them that did what? That scared them. That brought them fear. That's what they were looking at. And they forgot about the promise of God in 13.1 that I'm giving you this land. They forgot all about that. 
Why? Because they saw all, all these mighty nations of, of, of soldiers and men and, and things that they just could not overcome in their minds regardless of the promise of God. But look at Caleb in verse 30. Numbers 13, verse 30. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. He was part of that party that went out and looked at everything. He saw everything the other people saw. And here's a man that did what? He believed in the promise of God. He said, guys, we can do this. One lone person sitting there talking amongst the people who were spreading the discouragement, spreading the negativity, spreading the fear, forsaking the promise of God. And yet Caleb stood there in the midst of them and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Oh, but look at the next verse. But, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. I can't overcome what's going on in my heart, Scott. I can't overcome what's going on in my life. It's stronger than I am. God can't, God, God can't do this or God can't do that. I mean, this effect is what he's saying. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than they are. And yet God promised to do what? Give them the land. So in essence, God's not good enough for what's before me. And brothers and sisters, if God isn't good enough for you today, you've already lost. you just lost. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report. Do you see what's happening here? You see what fear does in this instance. Can you imagine what fear does in a congregation? Can you imagine what doubt does in a congregation? Can you imagine what division does in a congregation? Angry at the pastor, angry at the deacons, angry at your fellow brother and sister in Christ. Can you, can you see what that will do to a congregation? It spreads in like a cancer and it eats everything. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. Guys, they, they had forgotten the promise of God. And when you think negatively, when, when you have a, a, this spirit of just discouragement, and I've experienced it, my wife's experienced it, we've all at some point in our lives experienced this, what do you hold on to? What is your anchor? What do you dig down deep and grab a hold of? Is it God and the promises of God? Or is it something else? Because I'm going to tell you what, guys, I've experienced it. It'll kill a church quick. When you have people in the church who are discouragers, they're not encouragers, they're discouragers. All they want to do is bring something down because they're this, that, or the other towards whoever. All they want to do is they'll, they'd rather see a church burnt to the ground than actually go in there and get along with their fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus. They'd rather do that. Whew. And that's what's happening here. Let's forget about God. We're scared. We're afraid. We can't do it. Guys, everybody listen to us. One lone man stands up and says, no, this is what God has promised. We can do this. And no, do, do the people listen to Him? No. Look what happens starting in chapter 14. That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. They listened to the people who brought in the negative reports. They wept aloud. Look at verse 2. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Who was Moses? The leader. That's who God appointed as the leader. Aaron was who? His brother. It got so bad. With the negative report, 
with the unbelief of the promise of God. It got so bad in Israel that they all grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You see, guys, it's contagious. It's infectious. When we don't think about the things of God, when we don't think about the good of God, and we bring this stuff into the church, it infects everything. I've got three books in my office. Three books in my office that are dedicated to people. I just use this as one example. They're dedicated to people, um, to pastors, and they, they tell stories of pastors who've given their testimony of, of, of one person or a small group of people who their sole job the whole time was to get that guy fired. Three books, and it's awful. I use that as one example because that's what people do in a church when they don't trust in God. They don't trust in the promises of God. They hate the person that God has brought to the church to pastor the church. That's what happens. And so they mess it all up. Like this, they, they come in. And like I said, that's just one example. There's plenty of examples out there. But that came to mind because of who Moses and Aaron is. They're the leaders here. And they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them. So imagine Moses and Aaron and you're standing here and you're, you're trying to lead God's people. And you're trying to trust in God. And yet the people are listening to these knuckleheads coming back saying we can't do this. And the whole assembly looks at Moses and Aaron. And they said, oh, if we'd only died in Egypt. They'd rather die than believe in the promise of God. How do you reconcile that in your brain? If we only had died in Egypt or in the desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Did God save them? Did God promise them they would die by the sword? No. What did He promise? I'm going to give you the land. Where are they getting this nonsense from? From the people coming back doing what? Spreading negativity. Spreading fear. That's where they're getting this from. You see, when you listen to those people, if you're not grounded in the Word of God, if you don't know what the Bible says, and you start listening to that nonsense, what happens? Your theology gets skewed. You start to doubt God. You turn from God. There's all kinds of things that can happen here. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Again, where does God say that's going to happen? He doesn't. He promises to give them the land. Man, guys, this is a great example of just trusting in God. And if you don't trust in God, this is the outcome, right? Because this could be another sermon altogether in that. And look at what they said in verse 4. And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Do you hear what they're saying? They were slaves in Egypt. We should choose a leader. In other words, let's get rid of Moses and Aaron. Let's get rid of them. And let's choose somebody who does what? Wants to do what we want to do. Woo I'm telling you. Mm. Sadly, we see that in churches all the time today, don't we? Don't we see that in churches? Their outcome, the outcome of that was that their negativity brought discouragement to everyone, which led to them not trusting in God. It led to them um, wanting to get new leadership to take them back to a place where they were slaves. That's where that led. Guys, is that the kind of church you want to be? I mean, seriously, do you want to be a church like that? I mean, do you want to be a, a, a church that... I mean, guys, you can hate my truck if you want to. I mean, at times I do. So, I mean, you know, you can do that. Um, 
You can hate the flowers right here in the sanctuary. We don't have any banners to hang up, but I guess the stained glass windows, you can hate those. Um, You can hate me. Trust me, plenty of people do. Call themselves Christians. Don't get it. Um, Hopefully you got fed today. Um, If you didn't like the music, well, Kyler's gone. I guess you can say that now. Um, You know, well, I told them that my way was better. (sighs) Golly. Man, so let's go back to let's go back to Philippians chapter four. Notice what it says here, starting in verse two. Philippians chapter four. So they had some issues in their church. And there were two women who were arguing. He says, I plead with Euodia, and I plead with, with I'm gonna butcher this name. Sintesh, Sintesh, to agree with each other in the Lord. He says, I plead with them to do what? Agree with one another in the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I plead with these two women to do that. Why? Because this kind of stuff is disastrous in a church. You can, you can, <laughs> you can pick sides. Has that ever happened here? Hmm. I remember a time before I got here that actually happened. You can pick sides and what happens? You'll destroy your church if you don't get this stuff worked out. It's not about your friendships. It's about honoring God. It's not about your friendships. It's about honoring God and doing what God has commanded us to do. And a lot of Christians don't like doing that. How dare God tell me to do that? So he pleads with them. He pleads with them to agree with each other. And then look what he says to the church. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women. Help them to make up. Help them to do that. Has Christ reconciled you this morning? Has He saved you? Has He reconciled you? Has He done that? Yes, He has. Has He not? Then why can't you reconcile yourself with other people? I have a hard time with that thought process. I just do. I don't see how people can say they follow Jesus and then not want to reconcile. It's amazing to me. And he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and petition. And guys, how many times have you gone before the Lord in prayer? I mean, honest to goodness prayer before the Lord. And with petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Let me encourage you this morning. When you leave here today to think about the godly things. Think about the good things. That God has done for you. How many of you this morning. If you went home today. And you got out a piece of paper. And you got your pencil or your pen. And you drew a line down the middle. And on one side you put. What God has done for me. And the other side you put. Let me be negative. Which side would have more. If you could write out the things in your life today, right now, which side would be more? Would would the things of God be more than the things of negativity? 
What are you thinking about? And I say this because I know I catch myself. I told my wife this yesterday. I caught myself thinking about the negativity, the negative stuff. And I have to, I have to, I have to take that in and I have to recognize it for what it is and, and rebuke it and move on and move on and fill my, my mind and my heart and my soul like Paul says in Romans 12. Renew my mind in the Word of God. And let me encourage you today to do that. Renew your mind in the Word of God. God. And you can start right out there in the foyer. There's these little things. Our daily bread. Little devotionals. If you have a hard time, Scott, I don't know what to read. Get you one of those. Start there. And then let your hearts burn with desire for the Word of God. Who can you encourage today? Who do you know that's struggling with doubt or fear Anger, resentment, holding grudges. Maybe they're not. Um, maybe they're maybe they're trapped in something that you only you know they're trapped in a in a sin, and you need to go to them and you need to just talk to them. God puts people in our lives for a reason. You know that, right? Everybody that you come across, you're a minister to. Man or woman, you're a minister to that person this morning. Let's think about the good things. Let's take the negativity. Let's take the discouragement. Let's take everything that goes against the Word of God and let's flush it and be done with it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank You, Lord, for our time together. Lord, I ask that You would just bless Your Word today. Lord, help us to not be negative. Help us not to be discouraging. Help us, Lord, to, to love You and to love others and to uplift others and to be encouragers. And Lord, if we're struggling with anything, if, if we need to be convicted, let us be convicted. Lord, let us repent and come back to You. God, help us. Help us in this church love You and love one another and serve the people in our lives with love. But Lord, let us not compromise. Let us not back down. Father, give us the strength to live for You. For it's in Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen.